Hello lovely students and welcome back to English with Lucy. I have got a huge vocabulary lesson for you today. As always, there is a free PDF that goes with today's lesson. If you'd like to download that, just click on the link in the description box, enter your name and your email address, you sign up to my mailing list and the PDF comes directly to your inbox. After that, you will automatically receive all of my free lesson PDFs along with all of my news, course updates and offers. Let's get started with the vocabulary lesson. Today, I've got a slightly longer video lesson for you. We're going to be talking about vocabulary and more specifically, how to describe people's appearances. Now, this is a really, really important topic. It's normally one of the first things that you learn when you start to learn English. Um, but I want to go a bit more in depth. Normally people are able to describe basic appearances. I want to teach you slightly more advanced vocabulary so that you can really give an accurate description of people's appearances. If you find understanding me slightly difficult, you can switch on subtitles and so you'll be able to see the words at the bottom of the screen. So firstly, we're going to talk about people's bodies. And I think I'm going to start by talking about height, how tall somebody is. So you might already know these basic terms, short and tall, short and tall. But what about if somebody is a normal height? Well, there are a couple of ways that you can express this. You can say they are of average height, they are of medium height. If you want to be more precise and say their actual height in centimetres or feet and inches, you can say around. So I would say I am around five foot six. I'm actually five foot five and a half, but sometimes I say I'm five foot six. <laughs> um, other words that you can include are very or quite. So he is very tall or she is quite short. Next, we have body type and weight. Now, you have to be a little bit careful when describing somebody's body type or their weight because you can hurt their feelings. So firstly, I'm going to give you some positive adjectives to describe somebody's weight. And then afterwards, I'll give you the more negative ones so that you can understand when or when not to use them. But I will warn you, weight in the UK especially, and many other places in the world, is a very sensitive subject. So if you think you might insult somebody, it's often best not to say anything at all. Um, but that's not my role here, I'm teaching you words. So let's get started. So we have thin and fat. These are generally considered to be negative words. So let's talk about some positive alternatives. For thin, you can describe somebody as slender or slim. They are really nice words. If somebody called me slender or slim, I'd be flattered. Another word is lean, and this means that they're just skin and muscle. It's a positive word because it means they're in shape, they're muscly, there's no fat on them, they're lean. You can also call somebody petite. And this is when somebody has a small build. It's normally used to describe females who have small shoulders, they're quite short, they're just like a woman, only smaller, they're petite. If somebody is very thin, you can call them slight. They're very slight. And another one is lanky. This means that somebody is tall and very thin. It means they've got long limbs, lanky. If somebody has got a bit of meat on them, you don't want to call them fat, but some nice words you can use are curvy. This means that a woman has curves. Curvaceous as well. Womanly. Voluptuous. This means normally that they've got quite a big bum and big boobs. They're normally flattering when used in a non-creepy way. <laughs> For a man, stocky, well-built, muscly. Okay, now to touch on the negative words. Some quite soft ones for somebody who is larger are plump, chubby, round. This doesn't mean fat or big, it just means that they've got a little bit extra on them. You can also say overweight, large, big, heavy. And if somebody is very thin, you can call them underweight, skinny, 
bony, if you can see their bones. One word that's often used to describe very thin people that shouldn't really be used is anorexic. It's a medical term, it's not actually an adjective to describe somebody's physical appearance. Um, so try to avoid that one. Okay, let's move on to hair. Now, there are two ways in which you can talk about somebody's hair colour. You can say to have, adjective, hair, or to be, adjective, dash, haired. For example, I have blonde hair, I am blonde haired. The second one's a bit of a mouthful actually, to be blonde haired, I am blonde haired. <laughs> you can also just say, I am blonde. But that's better to use for colours that are very specific to hair colours, like blonde and ginger and brunette. So I am blonde, I am ginger, I am brunette, that's fine. But if you say I am white or I am black, it could be confused with skin colour. So it's best to say I am black haired, I have white hair. So we've got a huge spectrum of colours that you can be. I'm going to talk about the most common ones, but they are quite specific and you might not have heard of them all before. So let's start with the lightest and move to the darkest. So we have white, then we have grey, then we have platinum blonde, and this is white blonde hair. It's normally not a natural colour, but some people are lucky enough to have naturally white blonde or platinum hair. It's a really interesting colour. Then we have blonde, if it's a bit darker it could be called golden. And then if it's a bit darker than blonde, there are two ways you can describe it. If it's blonde almost brown, you can say dirty blonde. If it's blonde almost ginger, you can say strawberry blonde. Then we have ginger, which is more orange and red, which is like a darker red colour, obviously. <laughs> After that, you have mousy brown, which is a light brown colour, then brown, then brunette as well, which is another way of saying brown hair. It's normally a bit darker. Then dark brown and then black. Now, if you don't want to specify a colour of hair or skin or eyes, and you just want to say light or dark, you can say fair for light or dark for the darker colours. So I am fair, I have fair eyes, fair hair and fair skin. This means I'm just light. Somebody else might have dark hair, dark eyes, dark skin. So we normally use fair or dark. So what about hair length? Well, if you have no hair, then you are bald. I am bald. In a video that I did on Ali's channel, Papa Teach Me English, I was bald. If you would like to see me with no hair and, well, no feminine makeup, different makeup, then you can click up there, see if you recognise me. I look slightly different. Um, then you have short hair, long hair, but then in between you can have a bob. I have a bob haircut. In my first videos, I had very short hair and a bob haircut. I didn't ask for that haircut, it was a surprise. Shoulder length hair, medium length hair, long hair. If you want to say how long your hair is, you can say my hair goes down to my, so my hair goes down to my armpit, my hair goes down to my waist. As far as hair texture, you can have straight hair, wavy hair, curly hair, afro hair, which is really, really dense curls. The quality of your hair can also be described. If your hair is very soft, it can be silky or shiny. If it's not soft, if it's quite damaged, you can say you have dry hair, or you can say it's straw-like. So let's move on to the subject of skin. This again is a more difficult one. So we have the spectrum of white and black but different people like to be called different things. So I would call myself white. I have a lot of friends with darker skin who are often called black, but they would actually prefer to be called brown. Um, I would say when in doubt, use fair or dark to describe somebody's skin tone. Now in the middle we have tanned, and this means that you've been blessed by the sun, you've caught a suntan, you've gone brown in the sun, and in British English we say tanned, and in American English they say tan. If you're not tanned, then you are pale, and that is what I am 
all of the time. I am always pale, even when I go on holiday. Now let's move on to eye colour. Again, you can use fair or dark. Fair eyes, light eyes, dark eyes. So you can say to have adjective eyes or to be adjective dash eyed. So I have grey eyes, I am grey eyed. I am dark eyed. Most of the colours are pretty simple, blue, brown, green, black, grey, brown, I've said brown, haven't I? But one colour that's used quite frequently is hazel. If you have a sort of brownie green eye, it can be called hazel. So they have hazel eyes. Now lips. Um, you can have thin lips, uh, but if you want to talk about somebody with big lips, you can say they have full lips. So if somebody has big, kissy, pouty lips, you can say they have very full lips. If somebody has really sticky out lips that, and speaks like this, you can call them pouty lips. <laughs> but yes, full or thin, really. Next, you can talk about noses. So big or small, obviously, are the basics. If somebody has a bend in their nose, it can be called a crooked nose, a crooked nose. If they haven't got a bend in their nose, it can be a straight nose. If somebody has a small nose, you can call it a button nose. Um, if they've got a hook, a hooked nose. If somebody's nose is like this, it's a turned up nose or an upturned nose. Face shape. I looked online and apparently there are nine different face shapes, but we're going to talk about four today. You have oval, round, heart shaped, ends in a point, and square, if somebody has a square jaw. What about general appearance? I did do a video with Anna from English Like a Native about compliments, and we discussed some of the ways in which you can compliment people, so that's the positive adjectives. I will cover them in this lesson, but if you'd like to see that, you can click up there. But it's quite good to separate them into male and female, because one adjective that might be really, really flattering and positive for a male might actually be quite insulting for a female. Adjectives that can be used for both, the positive ones, attractive, beautiful, stunning, which means somebody is just amazingly beautiful. But then just for men, there's handsome, and just for women, there is pretty. Now, if you described a woman as handsome, you might be insinuating that she has manly features um, in the same way that if you described a woman, in the same way that if you described a man as pretty, you might be saying he has quite feminine features, which is not always something that somebody wants. Negative ones, you can have ugly or plain. Other ways of describing people, you can describe them as masculine or feminine, boyish, manly, girly, womanly. Right, your homework is to describe yourself in as much detail as possible. Put it in the comments and I can't wait to see your descriptions. Also, if you can add any more vocabulary, then definitely include that in your description as well. Today, I'm going to talk to you about how to describe the weather in English. We're going to start off quite basic and move up to more advanced vocabulary. I'm going to guide you through seasonal weather, hot weather, cold weather, wet weather, windy weather, and I'm going to give you verbs, nouns, adjectives, and idiomatic expressions. Idioms. We're also going to do a little bit of basic grammar at the beginning, but very, very easy, don't worry. You may know that British people are famous for always talking about the weather, and this is because we are lucky enough to have four strong seasons. Winter, which is really cold. Spring, which is sunny and wet at the same time. Summer, which is normally hot and sunny. And autumn, which is colder and with lots of wind and when all the trees lose their leaves. I'm going to talk to you today about different weather vocabulary that you can find in each of the four seasons. But first, let's discuss how to talk about the weather from a grammar point of view. This grammar is fairly basic, so if you're looking for advanced vocabulary, click to the time shown on screen. If you want to use an adjective, for example, warm, you could say, 
The weather is warm. The weather is adjective. You could also say it is warm. It is adjective. But it only really makes sense if the adjective is related to the weather. If you say it is good, I might wonder what, what's good? But if you say it is warm, I know that you're talking about the weather. You can also say it's a warm day. It's a adjective day. But what if you want to use a verb? For example, rain, the verb to rain. You would say it is raining. It is verb plus ing. That's if you want to talk about the weather right now. If you want to talk about yesterday or the past, you would say yesterday it rained. Yesterday it verb plus ed. Apart from the irregular verbs which have their own conjugation. If you want to talk about tomorrow or the future, you can say it will rain tomorrow, it will verb tomorrow, or it's going to rain tomorrow. It's going to verb tomorrow. If you want to talk about a noun, you would say there is, there was, or there will be, that's present, past, future, plus the noun. There is a storm, there was a storm, there will be a storm. Right, so now that's out of the way, first let's talk about winter, the month that I am in now in England. I'm going to start off with adjectives and I warn you there are a lot of adjectives associated with winter. You can say cold, cold, bitter, bitter, that's very very cold, it's just a step further than cold. You could even put them together and say it's bitterly cold, it's bitterly cold. You can say it's chilly, which is slightly cold, or chilling, that's a little bit more. Crisp, crisp normally means it's cold and dry, or maybe it's icy, icy. You can say it's freezing or it's frosty. You can also say it is severe or it is wintry. That means it's a very wintry day. It, it feels like winter and it is winter. If it's winter and the weather conditions are very bad, if the skies are grey, you can say it's gloomy or it's bleak. Or if there's a lot of very aggressive weather, you can say it's harsh. We often talk about a harsh winter. Now let's talk about some verbs. You can say to snow, which is obviously white fluffy stuff falling from the sky. To sleet. Sleet is partly frozen rain. So it's like very wet snow or very, very cold, almost frozen rain. It's normally very unpleasant. If it's sleeting, I go inside. You can also say to hail. If it's hailing, it means that little hailstones, little tiny balls of ice, or normally tiny, but there are big ones, are falling from the sky. It's completely frozen rain. You can also say to freeze or to freeze over. And to freeze over means covered with a layer of ice. So I might say, my pond has frozen over. My pond is covered with ice. Now, some nouns you might use to describe winter. So we've got sleet, hail, snow, frost, as I've mentioned before. You also have blizzard, which is a windy snowstorm. And for some idioms, you can have a cold snap which is a short period of cold weather, or you can be frozen to death or frozen to the bone, which means you are completely frozen through. Right, let's talk about spring. Spring is known for being sunny and rainy. It's warm and it's wet, and it's when all of the plants start to grow. Adjectives you can use are cool. It means it's not cold, it's not unpleasant, nor is it warm. Mild is the same thing, mild. Fresh as well, it's a very fresh day. You can say it's bright, the sun is out. You can say breezy, which means a light wind. It's normally very pleasant and welcomed. When you're talking about clouds, you can say cloudy, or slightly more advanced, is overcast, where there is some sunlight, but there are also some clouds, meaning that you don't have a completely sunny day. It's overcast. 
You hear the meteorologists on weather stations talking about an overcast day quite a lot. One that's not so positive is muggy. This is if the air is very, very humid. It can be cold or hot. You can have a muggy summer's day as well, um, but it means there's high humidity in the air. Another word you can say is simply wet. It's a wet day. It's been raining a lot. Time for some verbs. Well, talking about rain, you can say to drizzle. It's drizzling. This means it's a constant but gentle flow of rain. To shower, pretty much the same. That means it's more sporadic or occasional. Meteorologists normally say you can expect showers throughout the day, which means occasional patches of rain. You can say to pour, which is where it rains really, really heavily. Moving on to the nouns, you've got rain, which is uncountable. You've got a shower, which is a light patch of rain. You can also have a downpour, which is a really heavy patch of rain, or even a flood where the ground becomes inundated and can't absorb any more water. Idioms, you can say to chuck it down, which means a heavy downpour. You can say it's raining cats and dogs, although in reality we don't actually use that idiom that much, but it seems to be the first idiom that anyone ever learns. You can also say to bucket down. If it's bucketing down with rain, it's raining really hard. And you can also be soaked through. This is where it's rained on you and you are really, really wet. Oh my God, I'm soaked through. Right, let's talk about summer and adjectives that can be used to describe summer weather. Firstly, of course, we have hot. Other words that can be used to describe hot weather are scorching, sweltering, boiling, sunny. You could also say dry if there's not been any rain and there's no humidity. You can say it's a clear day if there are no clouds in the sky. Or you could say it's very humid if the air is very wet. You can also say it's blistering, a blistering sun. Verbs, you can say to shine, the sun is shining. You can also say the sun is burning if it's especially hot. And you can also say to scorch, just like the adjective. Nouns, the only extras really to add are sunshine, which we like to say a lot, and to talk about the heat. Now there are a couple of idioms relating to our reactions to the sun. You can say to catch some rays, which means to absorb some of the sunshine and maybe get a tan. You can also say to go brown, which again refers to tanning. You can also soak up the sun, which means the same thing again. <laughs> and one talking about sweating, you can sweat like a pig. Oh my God, I'm sweating like a pig, which means I'm sweating a lot. Finally, let's talk about autumn, or as they say in America, fall. In British English, we say autumn, uh, but we do understand what fall means because we see it on the TV and in movies. But in America, they say fall. Some adjectives relating to autumn. My favorite and the most descriptive is autumnal, autumnal. It's a very autumnal day. It tends to be windier in autumn, so you can say windy. Another lovely one is blustery. It's a blustery day. And it can also be misty or foggy, which is when there is cold moisture in the air, normally in the mornings. Some verbs specifically relating to wind. It can be howling with wind, to howl, or to blow as well. The wind is blowing. Nouns, a gale, a strong wind, a hurricane, a very, very strong wind, a tornado, that's when it, wind goes round in a vortex, and you've also got mist and fog, which I mentioned before, which is cold moisture in the air. Right, that's it for today's lesson. Your homework is to write in the comments about the weather from where you are today, and please mention where you are because I love seeing where you come from. Welcome back to English with Lucy. Today, I'm going to talk to you about how to describe personality and character in English, and I'm going to help you with your pronunciation. By the end of this lesson, you will know 72 adjectives that can be used to describe personality and character. I've divided them into positive or approving adjectives and also negative or disapproving adjectives. For each adjective, I've included the IPA transcription so you can really focus on the pronunciation and also the definition. Let's start with personality category number one. The adjectives within this first group describe how willing you are to communicate with others. 
So we have extroverted, extroverted. Someone who is extroverted is lively and confident and enjoys being around other people. The opposite or the antonym for this adjective is introverted, introverted. So this describes somebody who is more interested in their own thoughts and feelings than they are in spending time with other people. We also have talkative, talkative. This describes somebody who likes to talk a lot. Then on the other hand, we have quiet, quiet, which means tending not to talk a lot. Next, confident, confident. This means feeling sure about your ability to do something and be successful. And the antonym for this is shy, shy. Someone who is shy is nervous about meeting people or speaking to people. Right, our second category talks about how you make others feel. Firstly, we have warm, warm. Someone who's warm shows enthusiasm and affection and is friendly. On the other hand, we have cold, cold. Be careful with that O oh vowel sound. I do actually have a video on that, which I will link down below. Someone who is cold is without emotion and unfriendly. Next, we have kind, kind. This means caring about others, gentle and friendly. On the opposite side, we have unkind, unkind. This means unpleasant, unfriendly, maybe even slightly cruel. And then we have sweet, sweet. Someone who is sweet shows a kind character. The opposite is nasty, nasty. A nasty person is an unkind person. The third category is how you treat the feelings of others. First, we have considerate, considerate. If you're considerate, you are always thinking of the feelings of others. If you're not considerate, then you might be inconsiderate, inconsiderate. This means not giving enough thought about other people's feelings or needs. We also have thoughtful, thoughtful. If you are thoughtful, then you show that you care and consider other people's feelings and needs. The opposite is thoughtless, thoughtless. This means that you don't care about the possible negative effects of your actions or words. Then we have tactful, tactful. This means that you're careful not to say or do anything that might upset or anger other people. And the antonym for that is tactless, tactless. That's quite a hard one to say with the k -t combination. Tact, tactless. This means that you say or do things that might upset or anger other people. Our next category discusses how much people might be able to trust you. First up, we have trustworthy, trustworthy. We use a voiced th sound. I often hear it mispronounced as trustworthy, but it should be worthy. Your voice should be constant. It shouldn't cut out at any point. If someone's trustworthy, then it means you can rely on them to be good and honest. On the other hand, we have untrustworthy. Untrustworthy. This is somebody who cannot be trusted. We also have reliable. Reliable. If someone is reliable, then you can trust them to do something well. On the other hand, we have unreliable. Unreliable. Meaning that you cannot trust them to do something well you can't depend on them. Then we have loyal, loyal. This means remaining faithful and supportive. Then we have disloyal, disloyal. This means not loyal or faithful. Next, we're going to discuss adjectives that describe how honest you are with others. We have sincere, sincere. This means that you show what you really think or feel. On the other hand, we have insincere, insincere. If someone is insincere, they say or do things that they don't really mean. Next, we have frank, frank, which can actually sometimes be negative or disapproving as well as approving. So it all depends on the tone of voice or the context. 
If someone is frank, it means they are honest or direct and are sometimes at risk of hurting other people's feelings because of this. On the other side, we have secretive. Secretive. If you're secretive, you like to hide your thoughts, feelings and actions and keep them private. Then we have direct. Direct. And sometimes, much like Frank, this can also be negative or disapproving, depending on tone of voice and context. If you're direct, it means you say exactly what you mean and no one can pretend they haven't understood because it's very, very clear. Then we have not an exact antonym, but sneaky. Sneaky. This means behaving in a secretive or dishonest way. The next category is how open you are to the views and cultures of others. We'll start with tolerant. Tolerant. If you're tolerant, it means you're able to accept what other people say or do, even if you don't agree with them. On the other hand, we have intolerant. Intolerant. This means that you are not willing to accept behaviours or ideas that do not correspond with your beliefs. We have open-minded. Open-minded. If you're open-minded, it means you are willing to listen to, accept and think about other ideas. On the other hand, we have narrow-minded. Narrow-minded. This means you are unwilling to listen to new ideas or the opinions of others. And we have unbiased. Unbiased. This means that you're fair and not influenced by your own opinions or someone else's opinions. On the other hand, we have biased. Biased. This means you make unfair judgments and have a tendency to favour a certain group of people. Now we're going to talk about the adjectives associated with how motivated you are. We have strong-willed. Strong-willed. If you're strong-willed, it means you are determined to do what you want to do, regardless of what other people say. On the other hand, we have weak-willed. Weak-willed. This means you lack the ability to resist the influence of others and you can't control your own impulses. We also have determined. Determined. This means that you make firm decisions to do things and you don't let anyone dissuade you. On the other hand, we have irresolute. Irresolute. This means that you are simply not able to decide what to do. Then we have driven. Driven. This means you are determined to succeed and are working very hard to do so. On the other hand, we have apathetic. Apathetic, which means you show no interest or enthusiasm. The next category discusses your attitude towards work. We have industrious. Industrious. This means hardworking or busy. On the other hand, we have idle. Idle. If you are idle, you are not working hard. We also have ambitious. Ambitious. If you're ambitious, you're determined to be rich, powerful and or successful. We also have unambitious. Unambitious. This means that you are uninterested in becoming rich, powerful or successful. We also have hardworking. Hardworking, which means you are willing to work very hard. Or we have lazy lazy, which means that you are unwilling to work or be active. Now let's discuss adjectives associated with how good you are at learning and understanding. We have bright, bright, which means intelligent or quick to learn. We also have foolish, foolish, which means not showing good judgment or sense. There's clever, clever, and this is very common in British English. It means you're quick at learning and understanding things. On the other hand, we have stupid. Stupid, which means showing a lack of thought or good judgment. Then we have intelligent. Intelligent, which means you are good at learning and understanding. And on the other hand, we have unintelligent. Unintelligent, which means you are bad at learning and understanding things. Now let's discuss adjectives that describe how you treat money. We have generous, generous, which means that you are willing to give freely. 
On the other hand, we have miserly. Miserly. If you're miserly, then you hate to spend money. We have giving. Giving, which again means you are willing to give freely. And on the other hand, we have mean. Mean, which means you are unwilling to give or to share. We also have frugal. Frugal. And if you're frugal, it means you only use as much food or money as necessary. On the other hand, we have extravagant, extravagant, which means that you spend a lot more than you can afford. Now let's discuss adjectives which describe your attitude around other people. We have humble, humble. If you're humble, you show that you don't think you are as important as other people. On the opposite side, we have arrogant, arrogant, which means that you behave in a proud or unpleasant way and think you are better than others. We also have modest, modest. If you're modest, then you don't talk much about your own abilities and achievements. On the other hand, we have vain, vain, which means you are overly proud of your own appearance, abilities or achievements. The next one, submissive, submissive, is both approving or positive and disapproving, negative. Probably leaning more onto the negative side, but it means you are too willing to accept authority. You're willing to obey them without question. On the other side, again, it's normally negative, but it can be positive sometimes, bossy, bossy. This means that you're always telling people what to do. Finally, let's talk about adjectives that can describe how relaxed you are as a person. We have chilled, chilled. And this is slightly more slang. It is derived from the phrasal verb to chill out. You are chilled out, you are chilled. And this means you are very relaxed. On the other hand, we have tense, tense. This means you are nervous or worried and unable to relax. We also have laid back, laid back. This means you're calm and relaxed and never seem to worry about anything. On the other hand, we have uptight, uptight, which means you are anxious or upset about something. We also have optimistic, optimistic, which means you are positive and expect good things to happen. We also have pessimistic, pessimistic, which means you expect bad things to happen. Right, your homework for today is to include five of these adjectives in a comment down below and use them to describe yourself. So I want maybe three to four sentences about yourself using some of the adjectives that we've learned today. And if you can include any others, that would be really, really good. Today, oh, today. I'm so excited about this lesson. I've been excited since I wrote this lesson a couple of days ago. <laughs> Today, I am going to teach you 16 spiffing, old-fashioned British idioms that are going to make you sound oh so fancy. I think they make you sound really intelligent, educated and well-read when you say them. So learning them and saying them is no bad thing. You'll also be able to understand them more when you hear them in old-fashioned movies or TV series that are set in the past. Number one is a little birdie told me, or it should be a little bird told me, but my granddad always says a little birdie told me, so that's what I say too, and I think you should also. A little birdie told me means a secret informant has told me. Someone has told me something, but I don't want to say who that person is. I'm protecting their identity. This phrase is thought to originate from the Bible. An example, a little birdie told me that you went for afternoon tea with a mystery suitor. Ooh. Number two, oh, this is a gorgeous one. I love this one. A fly in the ointment. A fly in the ointment, it's so expressive. A fly in the ointment is a single thing or a person that is spoiling something that could have been very positive or enjoyable. For example, I'm looking forward to tomorrow, the only fly in the ointment being that I'll have to sit next to my dreadful brother-in-law. Disclaimer, both of my brother-in-laws-to-be are lovely and I would happily sit next to them tomorrow if there were an event. <laughs> Number three, oh, I know I'm saying everyone is great, but they are all really great. 
because I picked them. <laughs> um, number three is as keen as mustard. As keen as mustard. If you are as keen as mustard, it means you are very eager or very enthusiastic and interested in something. For example, she is as keen as mustard to get her hands on that tea set her mother promised her. Number four is to eat humble pie. To eat humble pie. This means to admit that you are wrong and apologise, especially in situations where this is very embarrassing or humiliating for you. For example, I had to eat humble pie and publicly apologise for spreading vicious rumours about her gap year. I made that up. I don't spread rumours very often. Number five is, pardon my French. <gasps> pardon my French. <laughs> this means, oh, please forgive my swearing. Basically, the person who has said a swear word is attempting to pass it off as French. <laughs> For example, oh, pardon my French. I don't know what came over me. Number six, another personal favourite of mine. It is hanky panky. Hanky panky. This is unethical behaviour, deceit or illicit relations. Make of that what you will. For example, I am certain that a bit of hanky-panky went on at the wedding reception. Number seven, this is a phrase I've used quite frequently actually, it is to see a man about a dog. This is a phrase that is used to apologise for one's imminent departure or absence, especially if you're trying to conceal where you are going or what you're going to do. For example, I am so sorry that I'm going to miss the rest of this delightful christening. I have to go and see a man about a dog. This would be me expressing to my friend that I cannot spend another minute at this dreadful event and I must go and go for a drink or go out somewhere. Number eight is neither here nor there. Neither here nor there. This means that's not relevant to the point or it doesn't matter. For example, yes, it was our first date, but that's neither here nor there. Number nine, this is a phrase used by my grandma a lot. Not because she sleeps loads, just it's something she's always said. <laughs> to go for 40 winks is to go for a short sleep or a nap without actually saying it because we're British and we don't like to say things directly. For example, I'm just going to retire to the sitting room and go for 40 winks. It's not a sleep, it's 40 winks. Number 10 is to turn a blind eye. To turn a blind eye. This means to pretend not to have noticed something. For example, I saw her take the last scone, but I decided to turn a blind eye. Also, yes, I pronounced it as scone. If you think it's scone, you can go nuts in the comments section. I'm not willing to have an argument on this. It's scone in my family. Number 11 is pot calling the kettle black. Pot calling the kettle black. This means hypocrite. This has been used since the 1600s and back in those days pots and kettles were both made out of iron and they were both covered in soot and they were always black. So if a pot that is black is also calling a kettle black, it's quite hypocritical. For example, you think I'm stuck up. Pot calling kettle black? You're stuck up too. Number 12. I can't do something to save my life. I can't do it to save my life. This is a hyperbolic way of saying that you are incredibly inept at something. You are unable to do it well. It's often used to express reluctancy and unwillingness to do something. And it's used in a self-deprecating way, very typically British. For example, if somebody asked me to make a Victoria sponge, which happens to me most frequently, but I didn't want to make it, I might say, oh, I can't make Victoria sponges to save my life. Maybe your mum could make one. Done. I don't have to make a Victoria sponge. They think I can't make them to save my life. Number 13 is to get someone's goat. To get someone's goat. This means to irritate someone. And the origins of this phrase are quite interesting. They're to do with horse racing. In the 19th century, Supposedly, nervous racehorses would be calmed down by placing a goat in their stable with them. But rivals would take or steal or get the goat, thus making the horse nervous again, and then hopefully the rival's horse would win the race. For example, you know who really gets my goat? 
Actually, I'm trying to think of who I can say gets my goat on here. Which really, I'm perpetually scared of offending people. There are so many people who get my goat, but none of them are worth drama. Number 14 is to kick the bucket. To kick the bucket. This means to die. In Britain, we don't like saying that someone has died. We like to say they have passed away or they have popped their clogs or they have kicked the bucket. For example, unfortunately, my great uncle Arthur kicked the bucket last year. Number 15 is the apple of my eye. The apple of my eye. This is one you may have heard before. It's very commonly used in America. The apple of one's eye is something that one cherishes above all others. The phrase was used in A Midsummer's Night Dream and it refers to a time when people thought that the pupil of the eye was a solid object, the actual apple of your eye. For example, my William is the apple of my eye. Oh, that's so romantic. I wonder if he'll see this. He, he claims to watch all of my videos. I don't ask him to, he claims to, but um, let's see if he notices. Apple of my eye. Or oh, you might not be after this. Number 16, I've saved the best till last. And yes, I have mentioned this in a video before, but it was a very long time ago, three years ago, because <laughs> I'm so old. Uh, it is Bob's your uncle. Bob's your uncle. And this means as simple as that. I use it all the time. As simple as that. Well, Bob's your uncle. There you have it. Easy as that. <laughs> For example, boil the kettle, place a tea bag in the cup, fill it up with water, let it rest for 2.5 minutes, maybe three, but no longer. Take it out, dash of skimmed milk. Bob's your uncle, cup of tea. Right, that's it for my spiffingly fancy video today. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. If you would like to learn about more old fashioned phrases, I was thinking about doing one on old fashioned insults, but, um, you know, maybe that's not something you'd like to see. You can always recommend what you'd like to see in the description box. No, not in the description box. You don't touch that. I touch that in the comment section down below. Today, I am going to teach you 50 advanced verbs that are going to make you sound more intelligent when you speak, and they're going to dramatically increase your vocabulary. Please note that lots of these verbs have multiple meanings. I'm focusing on one meaning per verb and I'm using them in a more advanced context. Number one is to alter. To alter. This means to make somebody or something different. For example, you shouldn't feel the need to alter your appearance. Number two is to amend. To amend. This means to change a law, document or statement slightly in order to correct a mistake or to improve it. For example, would you mind amending those documents I sent you? Number three is to amplify. To amplify. This means to add details to a story or a statement. For example, she refused to amplify further. She refused to tell us any more details. Number four is to balloon. To balloon. This means to suddenly swell out or to get bigger. For example, employment rates ballooned to 90%. Number five is to blab. To blab. This means to tell someone information that should be kept secret. For example, someone must have blabbed to the police. Number six is to brief. To brief. This means to give someone information about something so that they are prepared to deal with it. For example, the officer briefed her on what to expect. Number seven is to capture. To capture. This means to film, record or paint somebody or something. This is usually used in the passive form. For example, the robbery was captured on film by the security cameras. Number eight is to clasp. To clasp. This means to hold something tightly in your hand. For example, she clasped her hands together as she waited. Number nine is to clutch. To clutch. 
This means to hold somebody or something tightly. For example, I clutched onto his shoulder for support. Number nine is to collide. To collide. This means to disagree strongly. For example, my partner and I often collide over political differences. Number 11 is to command. To command. This means to tell somebody what to do. For example, she commanded the release of the prisoners. Number 12 is to cower. To cower. This means to bend low and or move backwards because you're frightened. For example, the dog whimpered and cowered at his feet. Number 13 is to crave. To crave. This means to have a very strong desire for something. For example, I've always craved excitement. Number 14 is to dash. To dash. This means to go somewhere very quickly. For example, I must dash. It was lovely to see you. It's a good one to use if you're trying to escape an unwanted conversation. Number 15 is to detect. To detect. This is to discover or notice something, especially if that something isn't easy to see or hear. For example, the tests are designed to detect the disease. <laughs> this is impossible. I need to include this in a tongue twister video. For example, the tests are designed to detect bacteria. <laughs> Number 16 is to deviate. To deviate. This is to do something in a different way from what is usual or expected, or to be different from something. For example, let's not deviate from the original idea. Number 17 is to discern. To discern. This is to see or hear something, usually with difficulty. For example, I quickly discerned that something was wrong. Number 18 is to dismantle. To dismantle. This is to take something apart, usually a machine or a structure, so that it's in separate pieces. For example, I had to dismantle the printer in order to repair it. Number 19, this is a lovely one. It's to eavesdrop. To eavesdrop. This means to listen secretly to what other people are saying. For example, we caught her eavesdropping outside the window. Number 20 is to escort to escort. This is to go with somebody, either to protect them or to show them the way. For example, let me escort you to your room. Number 21 is to expose. To expose. This is to tell the true facts about a person or a situation and show it or them to be illegal or immoral. For example, she was exposed as a liar and a fraud. Number 22 is to glare, to glare. This is to look at somebody or something in an angry way. For example, she didn't shout, she just glared at me. Number 23 is to gravitate, to gravitate. This is to move towards something or someone that you are attracted to. For example, many young people gravitate towards London in search of work. Number 24 is to gush, to gush. This is to express so much praise for someone or something that it doesn't seem sincere. For example, Rachel is always gushing about how much she values Prue's friendship. Number 25 is to hobble, to hobble. This means to walk with difficulty, especially because your legs or your feet hurt. For example, she was hobbling around on crutches yesterday. Number 26 is to hover. To hover. This means to wait somewhere, especially near someone, in an uncertain or shy manner. For example, he hovered over her, waiting for an answer. Number 27 is to ignite. To ignite. This means to start to burn or to make something start to burn. For example, Tempers ignited when the redundancy packages were announced. Number 28 is to intertwine. To intertwine. 
This means to become very closely connected with somebody or something. For example, their political careers became very closely intertwined. Number 29 is to lurk. To lurk. This means to wait somewhere secretly, especially because you're going to do something illegal or bad. For example, she saw someone lurking in the doorway and decided to leave immediately. Number 30 is to mimic. To mimic. This means to look or behave like someone or something else. For example, his behaviour mimicked that of his mother. Number 31 is to oppress. To oppress. This means to make someone only able to think about worrying or sad things. For example, he was beginning to feel oppressed by his surroundings. Number 32 is to peer. To peer. This is to look closely at something, especially if you can't see it properly. For example, he peered closely at the photograph. Number 33 is to pinpoint. To pinpoint. This means to be able to give the exact reason for something or to be able to describe something exactly. For example, the report pinpointed the areas most in need of development. Number 34 is to prune. To prune. This means to make something smaller by removing parts. For example, please could you go through the report and prune out any unnecessary details. Number 35 is to recoil. To recoil. This means to move your body quickly away from something or someone because you find it or them frightening or unpleasant. For example, she recoiled in horror after he tried to kiss her. Number 36 is to reverberate. To reverberate. This means to have a strong effect on people for a long time or over a large area. For example, repercussions of the case continue to reverberate through the financial world. Number 37 is to saunter. To saunter. This means to walk in a slow, relaxed way. For example, she sauntered down the corridor looking as if she had all the time in the world. 38 is to seize. To seize. This means to take someone or something suddenly using force. For example, he seized hold of my hand and led me to the exit. Number 39 is to shatter. To shatter. This means to destroy something completely, especially someone's hopes, dreams or expectations. For example, he shattered her confidence when he told her how he really felt about her singing voice. Number 40 is to shrivel. To shrivel. I love saying that one. To shrivel. <laughs> this means to make something become dry and wrinkled as a result of heat, cold or being old. For example, the long bath had shriveled my fingers and toes. Number 41 is to slump. To slump. This means to fall in value, price or number suddenly by a large amount. For example, profits have slumped by over 12% this quarter. Number 42 is to struggle. To struggle. This means to try very hard to do something when it's very difficult or there are a lot of problems. For example, I'm really struggling to pay all of my bills on time. Number 43 is to stumble. To stumble. This means to walk or move in an unsteady way. For example, we stumbled around in the dark trying to find the light switch. Number 44 is to trim. To trim. This is to make something better, smaller or neater by cutting parts away from it. For example, staff numbers have just been trimmed to 15. Number 45 is to upstage. To upstage. This is to say or do something that makes people notice you more than the person they should be interested in. For example, how dare you upstage me at my own wedding? Number 46 is to withdraw. To withdraw. This is to stop giving or offering something to someone. For example, unless you sign the contract within seven days, the offer will be withdrawn. 
Number 47 is to wrestle, to wrestle. This means to struggle to deal with something that is difficult. For example, we wrestled for hours with the problem of which task to start first. Number 48 is to yank, to yank. This means to pull something or someone hard and suddenly. For example, I yanked the door open and ran outside. Someone's dog barking. Number 49 is to yearn, to yearn. This means to want something very much, especially when it's very difficult to get or achieve. For example, I've always yearned to escape from office life. And number 50 is to zap, to zap. This means to do something very quickly. It's often used to replace the word to read. For example, I'll zap through this report and I'll get back to you in the morning. Right, that was my lesson on 50 advanced verbs that you can now use and impress people with. Today I have a vocabulary lesson. We are going to talk about clothes vocabulary, but not just the basic clothes vocabulary. We're going to go into detail. When you start learning English, one of the first things that you learn is socks, t-shirt, shoes, hat. But there is so much more than that. There's so much more advanced vocabulary. What's the difference between a t-shirt bra and a push-up bra? Or boxers and briefs? What would you call this neckline style on a t-shirt? I'm going to tell you all of this. I think we should start with underwear because hopefully that's what you put on first. <laughs> now I am going to be talking about menswear and women's wear, but I completely understand that you can wear whatever you want regardless of gender. We're just going from a vocabulary standpoint here. Let's start with men's underwear. In British English, we call men's underwear pants. Now in American English, pants is what we call trousers. So if someone from the US says, take off your pants, it means take off your trousers. But if a British girl says, take off your pants, she might be flirting with you. Now pants is a very general term, but we can be more specific. We have boxer shorts or boxers, and these tend to have an elastic waist and baggy legs. Baggy means loose or not tight. Briefs, which are also known as Y fronts, are shorter and tighter. They're often referred to as snug, which means tight and close fitting. We also have boxer briefs which have that same elasticated waist and they have long legs, which are tight fitting. Now let's talk about the women's wear equivalent. In American English, they call women's underwear panties. <laughs> now we don't tend to say this in British English. Panties almost sounds like something you'd say to a child. It sounds quite childish, which obviously when you're talking about underwear doesn't sit well with me. In British English, we say pants or knickers. So that pants word is a really general unisex term. Knickers is generally referring to women's wear. Now we also have lots and lots of different types of knickers. We have briefs. Now these are often rudely referred to as granny pants because they're bigger and they're not deemed to be attractive. But I can think of many occasions where having attractive underwear is not your number one priority. So briefs can be very, very comfortable and convenient. These cover you well, they are triangular, and they come up high and they finish low. If you want underwear that holds you in and slims you and smooths your silhouette, then you have the option of control pants or Spanx, which is actually a brand name, but because they were sort of the pioneers, like the Hoover, Spanx, they were the first in the market, so their brand name has actually become something that we use for any brand. We also have boy shorts, these are basically the women's wear version of boxer shorts. We also have knickers with just a thin strip at the back. These have many names. You can call them a G-string. I grew up playing the violin and I always found it so funny when my G-string broke. <laughs> I tell everyone, oh no, I've broken my G-string. You can also call them thongs or Brazilians. Thongs seems to be a really thin strip at the back and Brazilians are slightly thicker at the back. Now, some important vocabulary. VPL. Lots of women choose to wear thongs and Brazilians and G-strings to avoid 
the VPL, which means visible panty line. This is where the edge of your underwear can dig into your skin and be visible through clothes. I know I much prefer a seamless look. Seamless means smooth without any joins. A seam in clothing is where two pieces of fabric have been sewn together. That's the seam there. Let's also talk about bras. These are very, very important or not so important nowadays. It seems to be quite in fashion to not wear a bra. Bra is short for brasier, but oh, hardly anyone says that anymore. We just say bra. There are lots of different styles. We have a triangle bra, which is of course in a triangle, sort of more of a bikini shape. We have a t-shirt bra, which is a bra that's intended to be invisible under your t-shirt. A sports bra, this has lots of control, so there's minimal movement when doing exercise and running. We have a strapless bra with no straps. Straps are the pieces of material that go over your shoulder. We have a push-up bra, sometimes referred to as a wonder bra, but again, wonder bra is a brand, but because they were one of the early ones on the market, lots of people got used to saying wonder bra for every brand. The correct brandless term is a push-up bra, and this is where you have extra sponge or filling to push up your cleavage and create a bustier look. One last one we have is a bandeau, this is a strapless piece of material, normally without too much structure. There are two adjectives that you need to know when it comes to bras, padded and underwired. If a bra is padded, it means it has an extra layer of material. This helps you have extra shape. If a bra is underwired, it means it has some wiring below the cup, again, to give extra shape. Lots of women avoid underwiring for comfort reasons. Let's move on to another underwear section, socks and tights, the things you wear on your feet and your legs. Let's start with socks. We have trainer socks, and these are socks that finish just below your ankles. So technically they should be invisible when you wear trainers. We also have pop socks, and these just cover the outer part of your feet so that they are invisible in most shoes. We also have ankle socks that come up to the ankles, mid calf, over the calf, knee high, over the knee, and thigh high. We also have what are called tights in British English or pantyhose in American English. These are like long socks that come all the way up to your waist. So they are joined together at the top like a pair of leggings. The thickness of these are determined by the denier, which describes the thickness of the yarn or material used to make them. 20 denier pair of tights would be very thin and transparent and a 100 denier pair of tights would be very thick and warm. Stockings are a sort of cross between a pair of tights and socks that finish at your thigh, but they're normally in that tight nylon sort of material. <laughs> Lastly, we have thermal underwear, which we wear under our clothes to keep us warm. We have long johns, which are thermal trousers or leggings an undershirt, which is usually a long sleeved shirt. Vests are sleeveless thermal tops with thin straps. In general, we would just refer to any piece of clothing used to keep us warm as our thermals. Oh, I've got my thermals on. Oh, I wish I'd put my thermals on. Right, we're done with underwear. Let's move on to what goes on the top half of your body. In British English, anything that goes on the top half of your body is generally called a top. In American English, Generally, it's a shirt, but a shirt in British English would imply that it has a collar, buttons, and maybe cuffs. One word that you will hear a lot when talking about tops is sleeves or sleeved. The sleeves are the part of the garment that cover your arms. If something is short sleeve, then it has short <laughs> pieces of material on your arm, long sleeves, the opposite. We also mention collars, which is the material that can cover your neck, and the neckline, which is essentially a hole for your head. <laughs> I think neckline vocabulary is very important because different necklines suit different people. We have the V-neck. We have this. This is a boat neck. This has got a thin kind of crescent shape. A polo or turtleneck. We have a cowl neck, which has some extra material. And we also have a crew neck, which would be considered the most normal style of t-shirt neck. A sweetheart neck forms the top shape of a love heart. This is considered to be very feminine. Square neck, scoop neck, 
and a halter neck where the sleeves come up and go around your neck. I love halter necks in the summer. A top can be sleeveless or strapless. It can be strappy or have straps. I know my mum would say, oh, I love your strappy dress, meaning your dress with straps. Really thin straps can be called spaghetti straps because they look like a strand of spaghetti. We could have short sleeves, half length sleeves, three quarter length sleeves or long sleeves. Now in British English, a top with straps is usually called a vest. In American English, it's usually called a tank. Although because here in Britain, we consume a lot of American media, we do now use the word tank as well. But when I was younger growing up, I would always say vest top, but now I'm older, tank top seems to be just as common. This could be because brands are more international now, so they choose to use the American terminology. Something that's very popular at the moment, crop tops. These are short tops that finish under your torso and they show your midriff or your stomach. As I said before, shirts in British English refer to tops with buttons down the front and a collar and usually cuffs. We also have blouses. These are like feminine shirts. They're normally more loose fitting. They don't necessarily have the collar and they're considered to be more smart and formal. Cuffs are the end parts of shirts and to seal them, we, I don't know why I pinched myself just there. To close them, we use cufflinks, cufflinks. That's the accessory that many men receive on their birthdays. Let's talk about the tops that keep you warm. In British English, we have jumpers and in American English, they call them sweaters. If you said to a British person, can I borrow a sweater? I think we would understand you, but we might think maybe you're looking for sportswear. We do have sweatshirts, which are like hoodies, but with no hood and generally no pocket on the front. They're normally cotton with tight sleeves. Hoodies have a hood and a pocket at the front. We also have jumpers or knitwear. There's lots of different styles. Cable knit or chunky knit. My fiance Will loves a cable knit jumper. We also have Fair Isle print, which have that Christmassy design around the neck. Striped or stripy and also cardigans which are divided down the middle and are closed with buttons. Now let's talk about some casual jackets as well. We have a biker or leather jacket made out of leather, denim jackets, bomber or military jackets, and baseball or varsity jackets. And these are an American style jacket, but they became very popular in the UK and they, they're what college students tend to wear. We also have formal jackets. A blazer is a more casual, less tailored formal jacket. We have a tailored jacket, which is very close fitting. A dinner jacket, which has satin on the lapels. They are the parts that are folded back on a formal jacket. We can have jackets and coats that are single breasted with one row of buttons or double breasted with two rows of buttons. We also have a morning coat jacket, which has long tails at the back. Let's talk briefly about the different styles of coats. We have a trench coat, often found in beige, usually tied at the waist, very Burberry. Duffel coats, which are closed using those special wooden fasteners. Parker jackets and rain jackets. A ski jacket, a very puffy one for cold weather. We also have a shooting coat, which is used for British country sports and an overcoat as well. On colder evenings, women in particular may choose to wear a poncho, which is like a blanket that goes all the way around. It has no sleeves, a shawl, a big scarf that you can wrap around or a wrap as well. Those are alternatives to coats. Let's move on to the bottom half of your body now. We have jeans and we have so many different types of jeans. We can have high rise, mid rise or low rise. They can also be called high waisted jeans, low waisted jeans. We can have skinny jeans straight leg jeans, bootleg jeans, which go out under the knee, flared jeans as well, and mum jeans, which are very popular now. You can also have jeggings, which are a cross between jeans and leggings. They normally have fake pockets, and I'm really glad that they're not that popular anymore because I didn't like them. <laughs> we have leggings, which can be high-waisted or regular. We have joggers in British English, or sweatpants in American English. They are meant to be for athletic wear, but now athletic wear is everyday wear and sometimes formal wear, athleisure, I think they call it. Harem pants, which are very loose fitting. They've got a very low 
crotch, which is the piece of material between your legs. Wide leg trousers, they're becoming more and more fashionable. We also have corduroy trousers, which are made of a specific material, corduroy. Cargo pants or cargo trousers, these are sort of military inspired, they're baggier. Chinos, these are cotton trousers, often found in beige. Shorts, which of course are shorter trousers, or if you want really tiny shorts, you can have short shorts in British English or hot pants in American English. We also have skirts, there are lots of different styles. Starting with length, we have mini, midi, maxi. Mini's really short, midi's at your knee, maxi is down to the ground. Skirts can be pleated, meaning they have ironed folds of material. They can be skater skirts, which mean they go out like an ice skater. We also have tulip skirts, which mean they come in like a tulip. Trumpet skirts go out at the bottom like a trumpet. This is all very logical. We have tiered skirts, also called rara skirts. They've got lots of different layers of material coming off. And my favorite, a pencil skirt, which is just a figure hugging skirt that normally goes mid thigh to the knee. We have lots of different types of dresses as well that go over your full body. But one thing I want to mention before is a jumpsuit. So this is a full body outfit that has trousers as opposed to a skirt. These are usually full length. If you want your top attached to your shorts, this is normally called a play suit in British English, or it's called a romper in American English. Cute, short, very summery floral dresses are called tea dresses in British English or sundresses in American English, but there's a lot of crossover. We have fit and flare dresses, which are tight at the top and then go out for the skirt. Wrap dresses, which are wrapped around you and tied with a bow. Maxi dresses, they go all the way down to the floor. Ball gowns, these are very formal dresses, usually worn for evening events. Peplum dresses, they were a big fashion, weren't they? They are normally tight, but have a bit at the waist that flares out. Bodycon dresses and pencil dresses are usually very figure hugging and tight. Let's move on to shoes. We normally talk about our flats or our heels. So obviously flat shoes have no heels and heels elevate your heel off the ground. Ballet flats are of course inspired by ballet dancers. Kitten heels have a tiny little thin heel tall version of that is called stiletto heels. That's with a really thin pointy heel that is really difficult to walk on. Platform heels have a thick platform under the toes. Wedges have no individual heel, it's just all one block at the bottom. And we also have court shoes and pumps which are sort of lower heels. When we talk about flatter shoes we have trainers in the UK or sneakers in American English. Again there's lots of crossover now. Boots, these cover your entire foot. Sandals, these are strappy shoes that you wear in summer. And flip-flops, these are also known as thongs. These are very minimal rubber shoes that you can wear in the summer and normally at the beach. We have loafers, we also have boat shoes, Chelsea boots, and brogues. Finally, let's touch on accessories. Of course, we'd be nothing without our sunglasses. We can also call them sunnies for short or shades. We also wear watches, scarves, gloves, a handbag, handbags or just bags in general. I have heard people refer to male handbags as man bags. I'm not sure if that's really a thing. Why would they not just call it a bag? <laughs> we can also carry an umbrella. And one important thing to note is neckwear, especially in menswear, we can have a tie or a cravat, that's a different, that's like sort of a silk scarf that you wear in place of a tie. If you want a bow, it's a bow tie. We also have loads and loads and loads of different types of hats. A hat with a peak is called a cap. You can have a visor, which just goes around here. There's nothing at the top. A beret is French inspired, of course. A Panama hat, very nice for holidays. We also have fedoras, I know there are very mixed views on fedoras in the internet community. <laughs> top hats, which are very tall. My fiance wears a top hat once a year at the races and I can never take him seriously when he's wearing it. It looks too ridiculous because he's already six foot six, which is nearly two meters, it's 198. Um, and so to have a top hat on as well, it, it's just too much. 
when we go to weddings, sometimes, especially women, will wear a little decoration. It's not quite a hat, but it's a, an accessory on their head. We call this a fascinator because it just fascinates everyone. <laughs> we also have a beanie hat or a woolly hat, which is knitted. And if it has a pom-pom on it, we call it a bobble hat. <laughs> so cute. Right, that is it for today's lesson. I hope you learned something. I have thrown a lot of vocabulary at you. If you'd like to improve your listening skills and your vocabulary skills, even further, then you can try looking at my vlogging channel where I vlog my life here in the English countryside. Every vlog is fully subtitled so you can use it as a language learning tool. That is Lucy Bella on YouTube. Don't forget to connect with me on my social media. I've got my Instagram at Lucy and my website englishwithlucy.co.uk where I have a handmade pronunciation tool where you can click on any phoneme and hear me pronounce it. E. No. Air. It's a lot of fun and I had a lot of fun making it. I will see you soon for another lesson. Mwah.